have uh, with us uh, Dr. Tapan Sattar, Dr. Ravindra Raval, and uh, Dr. Uh, Naduri Suresh, Dr. Prashant Patel. So the uh, format of this session is going to be that we are going to talk about, oh, Shruti Singh has just joined in. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to talk about the current situations and the challenges that we are facing as the medical industry professionals, as doctors, as technocrats, and as uh, uh, people at the uh, strategic level making policies and structures for the system. Uh, yeah. None of these discussions are in relations to uh, finding the uh, uh, better way of fighting COVID-19 as a disease or none of these ways are going to suggest that because we would also refrain from those questions. We will try to keep it as doctor business centric or doctor industry centric or uh, doctor patient relationship centric uh, as much possible so that we are able to take our discussions to the next level and we for that have two eminent panelists from the industry. We have Dr. A.K. Singhal. Uh, uh, if you can introduce yourself, please, Dr. Sam. Right. Uh, thanks, Vinayak. Uh, thanks, Pankaj. Um, so I trained as a doctor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I did my training as a pediatric surgeon. And then I went to US uh, for training in pediatric urology. Returned back, uh, set up a couple of hospitals, one of which got acquired and one is still running. Then also I uh, delved a bit in telemedicine, set up a medicine, uh, set up a company in telemedicine where we were giving remote second opinions way back in 2010, 2012 when there was there were no apps and broadband was still a challenge. And uh, that company got acquired by 1MG.com. Then I worked with 1MG for almost a year. And now I'm busy setting up my digital therapeutic startup, which is called uh, Fitterfly, where we do uh, remote consultations uh, for diabetes, uh, PCOS, pregnancy, women and child's health. So that's that's my introduction. Thank you very much. And great, great great there is also you. a great surgeon. You should talk about that also. <laughs> <laughs> I still do surgeries uh, once one or two days a week. Uh, I do surgeries for children with urinary problems and we get kids from 20 countries to Bombay for those surgeries. Great. So uh, we also have uh, with us Pankaj. Pankaj is an avid uh, serial entrepreneur who loves making money for uh, investors like us. <laughs> And apart from him, of course, and he would he should talk about his in, uh, interesting journey of being a CTO for a certain pharma multinationals of the country from there to how he got acquired to the first stories. Probably if you can give a small introduction about yourself, Pankaj, maybe next one minute or so. Sure, sure. I would say I've been lucky in my entire life and career uh, due to people like you around me. So I started uh, my career with the pharmaceutical company. It was Renbaxi at that time was uh, part of the uh, technology team, was heading the entire Western region uh, for them and three SBUs which were contributing around 85% of the uh, revenue. Then moved on with a dream that, okay, India number one is done, we should move to the global number one. Pfizer was number one at that time. So I, I moved on to uh, Pfizer and was heading the medical department's technology innovations over there. And uh, after that, again, it was... Uh, uh, getting less interesting to uh, work on, then moved on to setting up a company by the name of Bristol Myers Squibb. So they were looking at, the, that was uh, at that time globally number 10, uh, was part of uh, top 10. So I was instrumental in setting up the entire organization in India and right from the second employee, we moved on to almost like 150 when I left. And last assignment was uh, with Merck Shop Dom, MSD, saw a lot of mergers, acquisitions over there. And then was being posted, uh, taken up as a regional director. That's where uh, the entrepreneurial bug caught me and uh, started my first uh, category defining uh, venture, I would say at the time, because nobody was looking at chronic disease management at the time. So I started my first chronic disease company. And from that, I flipped another one by the name of Swastam, which was focusing very much on diabetes. And uh, both were quite early technology uh, platforms at that point of time when few people understood in 2010 what chronic disease management is and how it can be handled. So we made successful uh, venture out of it and it was acquired by Dabur and uh, another London gentleman. So these were the two and then uh, now I'm on to my third one, trying to do something in, in the next space. Again, technology, love of technology hardly leaves me. That's me. Great. So uh, we are just about to start. We are uh, a minute away from this. And uh, just to share uh, some of the stats before we start this whole discussion, we are starting live with 32 people, uh, now 34 people rather, 
and uh, we have uh, almost uh, 250 registrations across four countries and uh, particularly 39 cities from india so there are 90 92% actually doctors as participants here and 6% are people from the pharma industry per se uh, and when i say pharma industry they are also mrs they are also uh, stock uh, owners uh, stockists as well as uh, senior pharma industry professionals and then we also have certain banking professionals as i see one of my uh, known friends have just joined in uh, from uh, city bank uh, singapore he had city bank there so uh, there we have people from the financial sector also looking forward to understanding uh, the business possibilities not just into the medical uh, industry per se but also in the industry of what we talk are going to talk in the future about it so uh, as this is now 2 pm uh, we will start with uh, 40 people in attendance we are starting the session so first question uh, goes directly of course to dr singhal uh, this is a very interesting question has been you know uh, going on with us for some time uh, uh, if you can you know tell us something more about it dr sir that a lot of people are saying digital health care has become very important in the country and as this uh, situation of covid-19 or a pandemic actually happened and we were forced to do lockdown at home major, majority of the people have experienced a very new world of the digital experience and the capabilities what we had created in digital and ai but was not available with the common people till date is now available to them or they are actually uh, being able to witness the kind of depth of services that we can offer so what do you see the pre and the post uh, you know covid uh, difference um, in this uh, situation for a digital health care scenario uh, what's your point Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's a that's a very interesting question because all of us uh, who are uh, working in hospitals or leading uh, healthcare companies, we always struggle. Is this a watershed moment for the healthcare? The same way demonetization was a watershed moment for fintech in some ways. Is this going to be a game changer for the healthcare out there? So there are two types of views which persist. One is an holistic view which says that okay everything is going to get destroyed, we'll perish. the other view is that change is the only constant now how you can benefit from this change is how you can use more and more technology now if you look at healthcare i've been a doctor for almost 20 years and i set up a technology company giving remote opinions way back when the internet was also not very powerful doctors and healthcare is generally uh, very slow to change the regulations uh, the viewpoint of the doctors the way they interact with technology the way the patients interact with technology is very very different from any other industry you will see a person transferring money to his wife on a phone but you will find it very difficult in march early march of 2020 talking to a doctor on phone and now suddenly we are in a situation in the first week of may where everybody wants an access to a doctor on a phone everybody has geo 4g network so i think we are going to see a drastic change in the way we will the patients and the doctors will start interacting uh, with technology so pre covid era the hospital was the focal point of healthcare you need to go to the hospital to see a doctor to get a blood test done to get prescribed a medicine you buy from the nearby pharmacy though there were e pharmacies there were diagnostics available but 90% of the system was hospital centric now the 90% of the system gradually at least 50% of it is going to shift to digital therapeutic platforms or digital platforms which will drive the patient and the doctor interaction and the further systems from from there so i think that is the single most uh, important thing which is going to change in pre and post covid era secondly uh, people will go to hospital only when required otherwise they used to just go to the hospital even for minor problems now they'll think twice before going to hospital thirdly the cost of treatment is going to increase because healthcare workers get exposed to so many uh, um, people they will need to buy protective equipment some of which will be disposable for every single person so that is going to drive up the cost of healthcare consumption so these are the three main things which i see happening in the pre and post covid era the biggest changes great uh, so uh, pankaj you coming from the industry from a very different side of the domain and the uh, side of the table where you see the technology as a technocrat uh, enabling uh, healthcare on to the next level using of ai bots and systems how do you see uh, what as dr singhal said the costs will increase i see somewhere of course the cost of digital uh, space and uh, digital uh, interventions will also somewhere levy on the cost of the overall uh, healthcare costs in the system in the process do you see there is a change over there or do you see this is something which you are we will be able to mitigate as a cost what do you see the digital and the technical part of the healthcare investments pre and post this 
So what I'll uh, how I'll maybe put this across is that between the pre and the post, there is a period of the COVID part of it. You know, that's what is going to change or maybe transform the behavior. If you look at the healthcare industry, we have been a laggard in adoption of technology. What may be a travel and insurance or uh, tourism or, you know, all those uh, entertainment industries would have achieved. Healthcare is yet to move there because there is a fundamental change of behavior which is resisting the whole thing. That's one. Second is there is a lot of regulatory environment over there also. And third is it's a doctor and a patient have to sit together, face, and until and unless there is an eye contact between the two, you know, the patient is not happy about the whole thing. So this entire behavior, it will take, take a while before it changes and it can be shifted to a, maybe a telemedicine and all that stuff. So while the digital health encompasses maybe the, the microbots or maybe the artificial intelligence part of it, telemedicine part of it, it's, it's a very vast field to uh, describe digital that way. I would, again, segregate the whole answer into what changes for patient and what changes for providers. You know, that's also very important to understand. So for patients, I guess uh, the behavior, it's going to be like during demonetization, Paytm moved on with a lot of, uh, you know, fast tracking or acquiring of users. There'll be quite a few digital companies in healthcare which will come up who will be able to grab these opportunities, which will be very consumer centric. So I definitely see a few companies coming up who will be taking a larger pie of maybe teleconsultations, maybe the artificial intelligence or maybe the, the data part of it. From a provider side of it, uh, in terms of technological adoption, I see it is going up. We are already seeing a lot of inquiries going, happening and all, but that is being driven just because of the situation right now. We will have to see how long this behavior can really sustain. Can that entire, uh, you know, uh, requirement of a patient sitting next to the doctor and, you know, uh, until and unless wo nubs check me hogi, tab tak, uh, you know, things will not move on. So those kind of situation is uh, something which you will have to uh, really say. Good part is uh, government is looking at it. It really took Corona to happen uh, for government to really wake up and create those telemedicine guidelines today. So uh, I wish these things were uh, earlier. We were we are in uh, you know uh, 21st century right now, 2020 year. It should have happened a lot back. Great. So uh, before we go deeper into this thought process, uh, let me just tell the uh, audience. Now we have about 70 people with us. Uh, let us tell the thought process here is that we would be just starting the ball rolling of thoughts, uh, thoughts among us, and then we'll open it for a Q and A round for everybody in next five six minutes time. And uh, whatever questions you have, you may see there is a Q&A uh, option given in the uh, bottom panel. You can write your questions directly there and we would try and our best ability to answer the best of possible majority of them. Uh, having said so, uh, Dr. Singhal, now that we have more 70 people and we have actually started our discussions, would you just give a small uh, introduction once again? Because in the interest of people, there were just 20 there. We have 50 more people now. So if you can just give a quick one, two minutes uh, about you, and then we quickly move on to Pankaj's introduction. Right. So I trained as a doctor from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and I've uh, set up two hospitals and two technology companies in healthcare. Uh, just like Pankaj, I'm uh, very, very close to technology in healthcare, and uh, two of my companies have got acquired earlier. I still do active practice uh, two days a week, uh, treating children with urological problems. Uh, and I run a digital therapeutic and a digital wellness startup called Fit of Flight. Uh, we are, uh, are well-funded and we are uh, rapidly scaling up in this particular uh, time of COVID. Thank you. Okay, great. So, Pankaj, if you can give yours, please. Sure. sure. So, I, I am a, a technological entrepreneur, I would say, uh, mainly in healthcare segment. I have been the chief technology officer for quite a few uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, started uh, two uh, healthcare ventures category defining at that own time, uh, scaled them up, exited. Uh, I'm on to my first venture right now. Great. So could you just name the third venture also, though, though we have seen in the posters? So. Yeah, I mean, so, it uh, it, it's very, very interesting. Actually, what we are trying to do is we're trying to bridge the gap of uh, physical and digital without forcing the behavior to turn digital. And as I keep saying, uh, change of behavior is a very, very difficult thing. You know, asking a doctor to stop writing a prescription and start prescribing and typing and all that stuff is a very, very difficult change to adopt. And we should respect and appreciate that. In sort of certain articles I've even read, you know, is this EMR a biggest disaster creating the most expensive typist? Doctors are not supposed to be doing all that. They are more productive when they see a patient face to face 
when they are writing, when they are, uh, you know, holding the hand of the person and maybe checking them out. So these are, uh, you know, few aspects uh, which we are trying to do. We'll talk about more on this. We are, we are bringing magic into the paper. Okay. So uh, just a small introduction about myself. Uh, I happen to come from a, do a family of doctors. My parents are both uh, MDs in their respective field. And I've worked with uh, uh, closely with uh, one of the state governments as the advisor to the chief minister for uh, family welfare, child and woman welfare for the state. Uh, uh, and uh, we had around about a few crore people in the state, around 20 plus crores. So you know which state. And then I'm also on the board of uh, uh, DBT BIRAC uh, at uh, one of the uh, systems wherein we are able to select the organizations which come from healthcare and biopharma and biosciences plant and animal husbandry and uh, also from the uh, bio uh, defense part of the world. So we do something there. Apart from that, uh, I am currently writing certain new laws for digital health, which uh, is also going to be a part of uh, the entrepreneurship ministry. And uh, we are, can't disclose much, but then we are thinking how uh, healthcare can also be a social enterprise into a profit sector, why it has to be something which is always taken as, oh, it's a humble and a uh, honorable, uh, uh, noble profession, but why should not it be also a profitable one? Keeping in mind, of course, the social part of it, that if people are not able to pay, they should also not be taxed for it. Uh, they, which I'm pretty sure all the doctors here would uh, appreciate and understand that they also would be doing the same. They would be taking care of their poor patients and helping them in the best possible way they can. So coming back to the uh, questions, this, uh, is a question which was there in my mind for some time now, and this has been being discussed even in the systems. Uh, uh, you know, what is exactly the, Pankas, this question comes to you, which is exactly the healthcare companies like yours, or you see the industry which is gearing to, what is that you are challenging up to as of today to meet this? If you can you show uh, some light on that. Yeah, sure. So uh, look, I think uh, today the good thing what is happening, and even with a lot of support from the government, uh, the good thing is every healthcare individual or a company is being asked to contribute and there are open platforms where uh, government of India is, is trying to gather all those information that how people can really transform and help the situation over here. Now, uh, where we come into uh, play is kind of uh, uh, imagine today you are in a lockdown situation and uh, you are looking for uh, some COVID testing at home to be done. You don't know where to go. You can't move out. You are in a situation wherein you want to consult a doctor uh, sitting at home, but you don't know how to go about it and choose about it. So we are we are trying to aggregate the providers at one place who are able to be available for the patients at their time at ease as convenient and all. That's what we are working on. That's where we have even contributed ourselves uh, to the Ministry of Health. We are working with the government closely on developing a system. We are about having a paper uh, with a with a doctor whereby whatever he writes on that paper, it digitizes everything. It's a normal paper. There is no iPad or tablet or anything of that sort. So that's something which we have created. A simple, smart paper feels exactly like a paper. It's your own paper, but printed with our methodology. That's where we come into picture and, and digitize everything. So uh, one part is uh, the, the connectivity in a lockdown situation between the patient and the providers with respect to whatever services are, are there, definitely. Then there is a lot of artificial intelligence segment, which in itself is a different one. And there are people who would want to do, uh, because digital health encompasses a lot of things. It would encompass robot-assisted surgery, AI, self-monitoring healthcare devices, mHealth, big data. So the opportunity in itself in digital healthcare lies huge. And just to add to it, uh, you know, one important aspect over here is the cost part, which uh, Dr. Arbinder also, you know, just touched upon. Just to give you an example, in 2001, Dr. Jakes from US, he was sitting in UR, he did a very simple surgery and he removed the gallbladder of a 68-year-old woman. The patient was in France, that's the difference, and it was done uh, through a robot-assisted telesurgery. Now, the cost of the procedure was not that great, but the legal cost and all the framework and which the U.S. didn't want to really have it on its soil to be done separately, it costed a whopping $11 million. So while, while companies and everybody else is trying to do a lot of technological advancement, there is a lot of uh, framework and guidelines which are missing out and the risk ability of the government as well is missing out at certain places to be able to do that. So that's a bit from my end. 
Okay. So, uh, uh, Doctor Singhal, what is your take on this part? Because I have now started seeing questions. You will also be able to see them. Somebody just has a very relevant question. This was uh, Rahul Janak Sinha, uh, who has asked this question that medical legal implications of telemedicine, and uh, uh, he is suggesting that I have not read it, so probably uh, he would have seen this happening. Uh, that uh, medical legal cases, uh, doctors are being ordered by the Supreme Court. Honorable Supreme Court says you cannot uh, uh, look and prescribe medicines on uh, WhatsApp. Uh, I just can uh, tell you this, that on a Supreme Court, Honorable Supreme Court statement, it is a guideline that uh, you have to keep your medical prescription records for the next seven years uh, for the matter of, uh, of course, medical legal implications. So if you can just tell us what is this uh, connect and how this thing is happening. I think uh, uh, the government has come up with very strong and very clear telemedicine guidelines on how the doctor should do a teleconsult or a telemedicine. And now uh, following those guidelines, you can very well prescribe any medicine, any investigation, any test. The basic points are you have to identify the patient or the caretaker properly. There has to be a consent which is taken. There is a prescription which can be either digital or a photo, or a photo taken of a, uh, a physical copy or something like which Pankaj's uh, platform generates, that's also okay. So it, there has to be a record, of course. It can be digital, it can be physical. And the patient has to have a conversation, identify himself properly, or the caretaker and doctor has to identify himself properly. If you follow these basic steps, the government has eased the telemedicine laws, I think in one big shot, all those archaic laws of keeping the files for seven years, all those have gone through the window. I run two hospitals, so we have a big MRD section and we need to keep the records for eight years you know, uh, proper filed and catalogued. But I think with the arrival of digital technology, all those spaces which are occupied with this physical record can now be just kept on remote servers, which can be anywhere else. So I think uh, the, the guidelines have changed and the government has acted very, very swiftly to bring uh, transparency, accountability, and, uh, you know, a proper uh, thought through process flow to the telemedicine guidelines. Great, great. Uh, Pankaj, this was a very genuine question coming from Babu Lal. Uh, uh, he has asked, uh, what is the security of the patient data? Uh, even that would have been my question that now that you are saying that you're going to capture the patient's data as uh, Dr. Oso Singhal said that your platform does that. If you can just give us a brief of what your platform does and how does the data gets secured. As a doctor, how do I see that data is not uh, cross shared with some other person or of course is not made public? Uh, so, uh, Vinak, uh, what I'll, I'll simply say is whenever you are choosing any platform, it is very, very important for anyone to understand that what exactly it gives. Is it is it going to reduce the risk? Is it going to enhance the positive treatment health or health outcomes for uh, my patient? Is it going to add convenience? Is it secure enough? Cost reductions and all. And having said that, while telemedicine and guidelines are very early, it's very baby steps right now. The framework are yet to be defined, but few things are very clear that even today, while we are not even in Delhi, while we are writing a prescription, we are not adhering to the compliances which are set out in the government that you are supposed to. Uh, Dr. Singhal, I think so. Pankaj signal somewhere went down. That's the beauty of the technology that we are all trying to levise so much. Yeah. As of course. So uh, coming back to one, once we will have the technocrat back with the technology. Let's have another question coming down, which is uh, asked by Gotham H, uh, which is which pharma companies right to invest in, sir? We can't tell you that part. We can't list uh, some of the healthcare companies which are PPE mass suppliers, of course. We are not the right podium for discussion for that. Probably if you can ask a medical question or a legality understanding, probably we can help you with that. Actually, there's a very good meme, uh, Vinay, clo floating about that. This is a time when a lot of people will make a lot of money and a lot of losses. So both the things are going to happen. The market is going to be very uh, you know, unstable, so it's better not to invest anywhere. Okay, so what are the measures taken by the government during the this time? And... Uh, uh, which would be helpful for the digital healthcare? This is a question coming from Vijay Kumar Shiv Puja. I think the biggest, uh, I think the biggest thing which the government has done is to release proper uh, telemedicine guidelines. Obviously, they were they are a work in progress, but certain progress has been made to assure the doctors how to do proper uh, teleconsultations, and they are even allowed on as simple a platform as WhatsApp. I'll give an example of what we did in our hospital. So we had a choice to go into various kinds of telemedicine platform, and you know. 
as a doctor i get about 10 emails every day a new company which was earlier into just uh, data or into you know emr has starting a telemedicine platform a lot of these telemedicine platforms are not properly thought through they are not user friendly and their data security laws as pankaj said also may not be very very robust so what the government has done is to frame a guideline which will help the doctor do the teleconsultation this is very important because lot of lot of patients if they don't see the doctor on time even using telemedicine they are going to miss out on the medicines or the early signs and symptoms of a disease and can uh, it can become very uh, difficult for them so as a healthcare provider myself what we simply did was we had junior duty doctors so patients pay through a payment gateway, gateway on the website and uh, you know we connect via whatsapp video call but there are empty numbers of platforms available now which people can use which adhere to these guidelines but as pankaj said we must talk about the security and the privacy of data of the patient there for some of these platforms had a challenge earlier uh, with the, with that particular item uh, so uh, we got the technocrat back with the technology sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, pankaj always <laughs> that that's the beauty of this whole system we still are struggling world over that's so pankaj you can just long, long live the paper <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing uh, uh, this was a question asked by dr astogi also that you said uh, this is a magic paper can you explain yeah. what is this magic all about we understand sure. science sure. we don't work on magic that's a good one sure sure no so and and we make it, we make science easy as as a plain paper so i'll i'll just quickly explain uh, what wonder rx does uh, you know by the name itself uh, the prescription we create wonders out of it so as i said behavior of a doctor is to write a prescription and we don't want to move him out and we still don't want him to miss on the digital benefits what he could have achieved so imagine a doctor who was earlier writing a piece of paper it goes out to a patient and then over a period of time the retrievability of it the adherence of it the compliance to the instructions written over there are completely lost and the journey of a patient is completely inconvenient now imagine a different scenario with wonder rx smart rx so uh, what we do is we customize the paper printing the way doctor would want exactly uh, you know what his entire uh, format was he would put widget so it's a it's a paper it's a 80 gsm 100 gsm paper which can be printed with a special technology it gets printed there is a digital pen and uh, there is an application now imagine doctor is writing on the piece of paper and whatever is being written it is instantly getting digitized and imagine you are sitting in front of a patient and you touch a widget and you are able to show a video to him on the paper you are able to record your instructions by touching a widget on the paper which can be further relate to the patient so all this is happening from the paper and what it does is you are writing and you are not losing eye contact with the patient very because the relationship of the patient is all eye contact and so digital paper goes to the patient on his mobile along with the physical paper as well so that's the beauty of the paper work uh, i would just uh, just uh, <laughs> take a small uh, space uh, with this uh, thought process that uh, pankaj has just recently shared us a video which we will be sending to all the uh, participants in the video uh, in the uh, uh, webinar here so if his voice has cracked up or if you are not able to come in through and understand what he was saying of course there will be something that we will be talking about in the process of it uh, so you will be coming to know what is this whole wonder x process was and uh, last one question before we move on to the next topic uh, pankaj we you are talking about the security part of the whole thing while this Correct. video got disrupted if you can tell us how you, are you going to keep the patient's confidentiality in the place and how the data is secured sure so i would i would uh, put following points on that so one is what kind of servers are you hosting you know is that particular environment where you you are hosting the entire data is it secure enough that's the first point second is going to be whatever is an identifiable data maybe the name email ids and and the mobile numbers and all whereby you can record that stuff i would suggest a strong encryption on those pieces as well uh, third is uh, the accessibility of that entire data should be only through a encrypted key so it's like uh, you know if you have got that key only you can uh, decrypt that particular data and the exchange of information between the patient and the provider can actually be transmitted through over a period of time blockchains as well and through these public private keys as well so these are few aspects of the whole thing uh, whereby uh, you can enhance the security nothing is 100% secure let me again uh, you know state this Uh, nobody even till date no not even microsoft or google or uh, you know any of the giant has assured 100% security but the 
measures to be really making it secure could be always enhanced. And that's what at OneRx also we have done at our end. We have hosted it on AWS, which is Amazon Web Server. It's pretty strong. One of the questions I saw whether you can host it outside the country. I don't think the laws allow hosting the patient data of a uh, national to be hosted outside the country. So you have to host it in, inside. And there are certain HIPAA guidelines which you know uh, give you some kind of uh, advice on how to store, how to transmit, and you know all take care of all the data. Okay, so uh, coming back to Dr. Singhal, uh, there is a question which has come down from a fellow doctor. He is asking a very pertinent question. Uh, and I think so, uh, it is Aarti uh, Rajwade who has asked this question. If I'm pronouncing the name, uh, please uh, don't mind if I'm not. Uh, how will the hospitals function post June? Uh, this is the most persistent question. Of course, majority of the doctors and the healthcare providers will have. So I think uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So I think we'll have to look at uh, specialty wise. Uh, now there are certain specialties which are very, very good for doing a telemedicine practice. Now as a doctor, I think uh, we should be get open to the idea where the patients who actually don't need to travel should be managed by teleconsultations. Now some of the specialties which are very good for doing a teleconsult are uh, typically general practice, dermatology, diabetes, uh, mental health, pediatrics, rheumatology. These are very good specialties for doing uh, you know, uh, teleconsults. So I, as a doctor, uh, I, I, my advice would be that, you know, uh, you keep a couple of slots a week for teleconsultations and uh, please call only those patients to clinic who really need to travel because every bit of travel will expose them. And uh, coronavirus is, is going to linger in the community maybe much longer. Hopefully not, but you know, that will be one thing. Secondly, uh, what I am also seeing post uh, lockdown is over by the month of June. There'll be a lot of elective work which will get postponed. Like until it's an emergency, a lot of surgeries are going to get uh, postponed. So for people who are, uh, you know, doing mostly elective work, so probably th their practice is going to take a, a bit of hit. Um, and uh, so those are the two things uh, which will be very important uh, uh, for everyone to understand. Okay, sounds nice. Uh, Pankaj, uh, this is another question which comes to you that all of these digital platforms that are working today. Uh, are being able to share data across board. Uh, how safe is this going to data? Of course, that you have answered, but how well do you see will be able to work across board in multiple types of report sharing and data sharing among the doctors, of course, for a second opinion of things, situations, uh, which can be, you know, foreseen. So uh, I think, and I was reading another uh, similar question over here as well. I would uh, say that, uh, you know, first of all, when you're choosing a system, we would want to avoid, uh, so most of the good systems would not allow recording of the video, right? When you are doing a telehealth, uh, it's a patient's data. It's a very secure data. Even if uh, ABC is transacting and using that particular platform, they should not record that. It's, it's a lot about confidentiality, which is there. So any teleconsultation happening through video and tele should, should not be uh, taken up at all on that. Uh, that is one aspect of it. Second, uh, I, I saw a relevant question on the rural part of it, that how can the, uh, you know, the rural aspect can be connected to the uh, urban as well. Now, let, let's understand 75% of the resources are in urban, whereas 75% of the population is in villages. I, I think digital health can play a lot of role. We have got enough bandwidth available. There are systems which can work on even smaller bandwidth and that can really transform a lot of things which are not available for the rural population which can be connected to the urban. And I missed the other part which you were saying, sorry. So uh, there are certain <laughs> data. For example, I want to share an x-ray report or a blood report. A blood yeah. report can go for a scan, but how do you share a scanned x-ray report? Do you need special devices to do that? Or yeah. there can be MRI, MRI reports. So there can be so many other things which probably can be shared on a lifetime, uh, you know, real-time basis. And there are organizations now available across the board in the country, not even only India, but Europe and US, yeah, yeah. which are able to stream data live to doctors. Yeah. So and you know, I think you know, uh, even most of the, sorry, I'll, I'll just uh, like to add something. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, please. So, uh, so regarding these X-rays and uh, MRIs, so most of the scan centers, if you ask them for a JPEG picture of an X-ray, they'll be able to give. Most of the X-rays are digitized across the country. You can carry a USB uh, USB drive. You can even click a good picture with your camera from the X-ray screen itself. That's very much possible. And that's what we doctors routinely do, consulting each other. Suppose I see a patient whose X-ray needs to be shared with somebody. I just take a picture uh, and share it. Similarly, patients also do. 
and mri scans also are able to give up uh, give these files uh, which are called dicom data you can just click on that and it's typically for mri it's about 10 to 12 mb file which can be very well shared with a simple dicom light viewers are available and a uh, lot of technology platforms in india which are doing teleconsult they have embedded the uh, dicom viewer now in the files and and that's exactly what I, I was coming to so there is a lot of interoperability which is required to be done it is not reached the stage so imagine any kind of a machine doing any kind of a pet ct mri and all that it should be able to uh, talk to the other system so there has to be that layer of interoperability whereby there are a lot of third party tools which are coming up there they have already done it for larger systems but i think on a broad basis to have very standard guidelines is still missing out there are new uh, technologies evolving and enhancing very very quickly and i guess once we have those interoperability standards available and some kind of uh, mechanism and guidelines from the government as well it will be helpful okay so uh, dr singhal this is a question coming from sam uh, directly with you that uh, and also probably pankaj you can give your take uh, how do you take care of uh, medical legal Uh, issues uh, arising out of the treatment subscribed through digital platforms without examining the patient physically knowing that there would be a error of judgment not by examining the pt so i think uh, there there is uh, uh, there your basic sense or what you call the sixth sense becomes very very important wherever you feel a little bit uncomfortable that the data of the patient is not complete or you're not able to do a critical part of the examination on teleconsult please don't prescribe medicine ask the patient to go and see a doctor physically there are some conditions in which physical examination is mandatory we cannot skip that on doing even teleconsult only prescribe only write for treatment in those conditions where you are fairly certain of the diagnosis and you do not need a physical examination so so that's the first law which every doctor should clearly understand telemedicine is an adjunct to Uh, is a complete diagnosis for a lot of conditions but for a lot of conditions it cannot be the complete uh, diagnosis in itself diagnostic uh, way to itself right and if i may add uh, you know there there are certain courses now which are being run by various doctor organizations themselves uh, whereby how do you really evaluate a person on telephone or on a video to be able to not make mistakes even in those areas where you are allowed to do telemedicine leave aside those where you definitely need to see the patient in person so i guess those kind of courses are also mandated even the telemedicine guidelines if you read carefully in in 3 years time you as a doctor you are supposed to be taking some online course to be able to say yourself that i can e consult uh, there is a very interesting question uh, 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 vinayak which i am seeing yeah. and this is the common thing which i see with lot of doctors how to ensure that data shared on telemedicine platform won't be sold to third party now this yeah, is i was going to ask you the same one actually <laughs> no, i was going to come and say so i was a part of a group here uh, which were drafting telemedicine guidelines and you know how to select a proper telemedicine payer now i have seen lot of news flying around that uh, certain e pharmacy and a certain digital health platform will be selling your data now that's not true most of these companies are funded by international investors which have very very strong laws and which have very very strong code of conduct in the way they operate now uh, this is a scare probably spread by a lot of people uh, just to you know damage uh, the reputations of these uh, internet platforms but most of the big platforms which are funded by international investors they are safe to go to now as a doctor what you should do is you should read the cons- uh, read the consent which you give when you join the platform and similarly for the patient and particularly particularly go to the section where the data sharing is clearly mentioned as pankaj said all the patient personal identifiable data should be removed while sharing the information and all this should be encrypted and shared uh, able to be available only through a encrypted key most of these consent forms will have this information and if you don't find this information then don't sign up with those telemedicine platforms this is a question relating to the same one uh, uh, doctor probably you will answer it from a very different aspect and pankaj i want you to answer from the corporate side of it how do you see the role of pharma companies now with telemedicine and uh, will they get into this of course they will get into this that i can answer uh, but uh, uh, what will their reps do this is a very persistent question i really connect to that because i understand the pains and the future uh, worries that a rep will have if the telemedicine will become the norm of the day so if uh, probably uh, pankaj first you can answer this from the pharma industry side itself Uh, look uh, as i think and and historically if we have seen the role of pharmaceutical industry has been 
pretty engaging in the entire various technological advancements which have happened in the industry uh, across. Now, uh, one of the aspects which the uh, question is being asked is that today the medical reps go and meet. And eventually, if this continues beyond a point, it might slow down or it might come to a halt. And even before pre-COVID, I have seen a lot of hospitals that reps not allowed. You know, those kind of signboards were coming. So these were early warning signs for pharmaceutical companies and as any corporate would uh, want to uh, achieve and start working on those early warning signs, these pharma companies started working their digital strategies long time back. So around three years back, there was not even a digital guy within a pharma industry. Now you would find a complete department in the digital, in each and every pharma, major pharma companies, they would have a digital head and they'll have digital marketing managers and all. So they are trying to leverage various channels to reach out to the doctors in the most balanced manner because again, doctors, as an individual, he would have seen, let's say, 10 reps in a day. But when it comes to digital, he can be bombarded by 1,000 different channels. So there is also going to be a lot of concern from a doctor's perspective that how do you balance that communication, the right communication, authentic communication, and in a very balanced manner. And pharma will definitely lead a role in this. They are already active. There are a lot of things going on around. Uh, Pankaj, I would like to add uh, something to that. I think, uh, Pankaj, you've touched on most of the points. But uh, Vinayak, what I've seen in the last few days, ever since the lockdown has happened, and as the MRs are not able to visit uh, uh, the hospitals, Pharma has uh, come up with certain innovative digital strategy to you know, uh, make sure that the doctors are engaged. So we are working with a couple of pharma companies where they have sponsored wellness or immunity programs through Fit of Life for the doctors. And doctors are very engaged, you know, doctors generally don't take care of themselves. They work very long hours. They don't take care of their health. So we have a specialized health program, a digital therapeutic program for doctors where they, where they help them with their healthy lifestyle. And doctors being doctors, some of them have diabetes, some of them have, uh, you know, uh, with advancing age immunity issues. So we are able to help with them. So that is a very interesting turn which the pharma company has taken uh, uh, in terms of engaging the doctors. Then I, I also know of five or six pharma companies which are also rolling out uh, telemedicine platforms, uh, helping the doctors to uh, do teleconsults. There are a lot of webinars being organized. My wife is an ophthalmologist and she says in ophthalmology on a daily basis, there are 20 webinars happening. So it is like death by webinar, which is actually happening these days. I totally agree, <laughs> totally agree. And then That's finally, the, uh, what another thing which is uh, happening is a lot of pharma companies are actually doing good work around updating the knowledge of the doctors. So a lot of doctors, if you look at in tier two, tier three cities, they have such busy practices seeing 80 to 100 patients, sometimes till eight or nine in the night. Now these people are really engaging on uh, some of these knowledge platforms and updating their knowledge, updating the latest guidelines, reading them. So I think there is a certain reboost happening in terms of latest uh, guidelines and uh, doctors adopting them. And this is very well supported by the pharma companies. So, so they are not sitting idle. Of course, as you rightly said, death by webinar is happening all over. A lot of people are uh, really crazed out. Uh, while being in this session, I got a reminder of around nine webinars which I've missed somehow. <laughs> there are a lot I, of I memes also. Out. There are a lot of memes going around. <laughs> very, very true, very true. The best one being Alia Bhatt's meme that I don't want to go to a webinar. She's crying it out. <laughs> yes. That's a true one. So coming back to this, there is one very uh, intriguing question, which I found it to be how doctors who wish to pursue a career in the digital healthcare domain, go ahead, comes from Naresh Jamani. If you can answer that, uh, probably Dr. Singhal. So I will be a primary example of a doctor who trained as a super specialist doctor, trained for 13 years to do pediatric urological surgeries and still went into digital health. So uh, I think it's very easy. You, you first need to start uh, you know, reading about the basics of technology, how it works. And uh, it can be uh, starting as simple as learning how to make your own website, uh, learning how the, how the design framework of a particular software works, then go on to understanding how certain platforms or certain things are designed in the way it's called user design or user experience. Then the best way to get into digital health is actually uh, work with the company. Uh, which is into digital health, uh, either as a content writer or, a, or as a medical program manager. Um, and once you have a little bit of knowledge and you like that, you, uh, you enjoy this because uh, if you're trained as a doctor for eight or 10 years, uh, some doctors do not like that kind of environment uh, uh, where they are not the commanders of the ship. If you look at the typical doctor attitude, when you're in a hospital, you're the boss. Everybody looks up to you, you can do anything. But when you, join, when you go to digital health, you really start at the bottom of the ladder in some ways. 
you don't know much about technology you have really uh, spent all your life uh, seeing patients and in clinics so it can be a little humbling experience but uh, it can be very rewarding as well uh, uh, where you can go and meet amazing people like pankaj and set up companies as well with them have a good partner with you <laughs> uh, this is a com- uh, question coming from devasis in connection to what you just said uh, uh, dr singhal uh, he has asked a very uh, touching point here a lot of telemedicines are now highlighting their own features how can we select the best one and in what basis what goes on what basis is something uh, you know uh, as a doctor and uh, pankaj as a technocrat you both could answer but i feel there is one thing important that has to be also mentioned here which is on what legality of ground that you should be doing this so that's something very really more important uh, when you're talking about that so the answer will be from two perspectives one is the the ease of use i think that is the most important factor in in choosing a telemedicine platform how easy it is for you and remember you as a doctor may still use it but what about your patient would they be able to pay easily would they be easily able to do everything at one click is it going to be very cumbersome for the patient so the the user experience becomes the first and the foremost things in this and the second thing is around legality make sure that you know you do everything right from your perspective which is identifying the patient taking the consent doing all those things necessary and refusing certain consults where a physical examination is required i think that is where most of the legal parts taken care of and the last most important part is the security and privacy of your data and your patient's data so once you find a platform which matches all these things then you go ahead with the platform i recently conducted a technical due diligence for uh, three telemedicine platforms and they were great platforms but they were so difficult to use for the doctor and the patient because they were made by somebody who was not actually seeing patients so i think for creating digital uh, platform you either need to have a huge experience of having worked in the healthcare or you should have a doctor somebody like devashish who's your partner in designing that experience yeah, exactly pankaj uh, exactly. yeah. what's your take on this no i i would absolutely agree and uh, dr arvind has covered most of it so as i said uh, you know initially also you need to have the right experience to be able to define the right platform it's not about creating a, a platform which is superbly uh, you know having hundreds of features but you know hardly two are put to use so we need to look at first as ease of use uh, after you have evaluated who's the guy behind uh, developing it what's the platform's efficiency A lot of times, people use cheap methodologies of video consulting platforms, which are available, because they'll come cheap, but they'll the efficiency of the whole thing will not be good enough. So you you would want to even understand what the kind of uh, video tele platform which you guys are using is it efficient enough? Is it able to stream the data on a lower bandwidth as well? Right? Whether it is contextually rich in features to you, not contextually rich in features to their uh, selling pitch. Uh, how does it take care of? Yeah, Pankaj, there is something which is also a connecting question here. Somebody asked that if I'm doing this telemedicine uh, uh, stuff, uh, this was a very uh, important one. That uh, will I be able to save a data from a WhatsApp? First of all, uh, say uh, you know, saving a data out of WhatsApp is not legal in this country as of today. So please don't try that. And uh, taking your own personal data for your own personal use is completely allowed. You can always have your own data, but then keeping it for a medical reason or for a commercial reason or for a reason of knowledge without the uh, permission of that individual is of course not allowed at any point of time. You can't even record a phone call for that matter. Uh, mm-hmm. So here, uh, here is something, Pankaj, that if I want you to please also just add this point of. I, I, as I understand, your company is also able to do something in terms of recording the data. So, how do you legally do it, and how do you, uh, how does a doctor share it with a second opinion? At the same time, what does it happen uh, uh, to uh, the industry uh, which is not related or compiled with the legalities? Because I, as I understand, uh, the medical industry fraternity is exactly highly challenged with the medical legal cases while they are challenged with saving a life at the same time. So, how how does this whole thing work? and how are you able to you know safeguard them to your of ability in your yeah so so at our end what we do is uh, none of the data uh, gets transacted on any of the open platforms not even the doctor can himself download the data on any excel so we make sure that the platform is there and even if uh, there are certain transmissions of data going to any third party it is encrypted and there is a key floating around with it we also ensure that any consent of the patient an explicit consent of the patient is taken even if the data has to be shared with any concerned third party let's say maybe the doctor would want to refer the patient to another hospital and but it should not happen without the consent of the patient again so these are the few things uh, which are uh, 
from a technology and a guideline perspective, we can look at that data transmission has to be secure. It should not be on Facebook, WhatsApp, and other any open platforms. It should be on end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, second is uh, uh, the guidelines have to be followed. One of the major one is that an explicit consent must be taken from the patient before sharing your uh, patient's data with anyone else, whether clinical reasons or non-clinical reasons. Okay, so here uh, is a quick question. Uh, Doctor, probably you can have answer is this well. Uh, what are the telemedicine, uh, uh, you know, uh, usage as well as softwares or, or as well as uh, capabilities or as well as usabilities for the field of pathology and the field of dentistry? So pathology has, is actually very, very advanced. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, most of the time in US, uh, so full cancer care and neurological and rare diseases care is completely on telepathology platforms now. And in fact, telepathology platforms have become so efficient that they have a lot of artificial intelligence embedded in them, which can actually flag off a lot of slides at one go. There's a big startup in India called Niramai and also Sikkapal, which have completely digitized the uh, uh, yes. investment in them. <laughs> uh, no, I'm on the board of Niramai in terms of advising them to the next level. Right. And so I, I selected them in Bayrak. <laughs> perfect. So yeah. So I think telepathology has moved leaps and bounds when it comes to uh, 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 to pathology per se. I think telemedicine is the way to go in pathology. But for dentistry, it's still a challenge because dentistry, uh, it is very difficult to take those images inside the mouth and still somebody needs to do it properly to be able to send. And secondly, even in dentistry, there's a lot of clinical examination value which is there. So uh, my knowledge regarding dentistry and teledentistry is relatively limited, but whatever I've known, a couple of my, uh, my brother-in-law is a dentist and he has a big practice in Delhi and uh, he is struggling. He says, uh, our patients keep on sending me pictures of their mouth and inside of the mouth asking for prescription, but I find it very difficult to give them any kind of you know, advice regarding from that. Okay, coming quickly to a very short answer, uh, in a probably yes and no, we can quickly move out because this is a very generic question, but then important one. Is sending prescriptions on WhatsApp safe? Yeah, absolutely safe because if you have sent your, uh, taken a picture of your prescription and you have uh, clicked it, you can very well send it to uh, WhatsApp. It's absolutely safe. And WhatsApp is actually third party secure also. It's a very secure platform. Uh, I'll just add to the legal part of it. If it's a doctor sharing a prescription without the patient's knowledge, that is not allowed. It no, has to be uh, consulted. to the patient only. Yeah. It's yes. for the patient who has done a consult with you. Correct. Yeah. So at any point of time, any conversation, any uh, documentation being shared among people or recording being done among people, even video recording, if it is being uh, known and aware to all of the parties concerned, then it is completely okay and legal to do that. So uh, there's one very hidden. Yeah, there's one very interesting question about user satisfaction factors between traditional practices and digital practices. So I think from India, the data is not available, but uh, there's a lot of data available from the largest uh, teleconsulting practice uh, in US called Teladoc, where they have for at least 16 common primary GP diagnoses, which account for almost 60% of the hospital visits. They're able to have equal satisfaction scores between telemedicine and traditional practices. It may not be valid for a lot of other specialties, but for certain common, uh, common symptoms and common primary GP practice, it's equally effective. And within India, it remains to be seen. India is a very touch and feely society. And uh, in America, technology usage has always been high. Distances are long. Uh, doctor uh, appointments are difficult to get. And doctor appointments are expensive also. India, uh, the healthcare is cheap. Doctors are easily available. And uh, we are very emotionally connected to feeling and seeing the doctors. So probably the satisfaction scores in India will be different, but it remains to be seen. Uh, Pankaj, this comes to you. Are there measures that can help a clinician track his or her own competencies in offering uh, telehealth? Comes from Dr. Rupa Srinivas. Sorry, uh, please come again. Are there measures that help a clinician track his or her, his, her, or, his or her own uh, competencies in offering telehealth? Uh, so I, I would say that a lot of uh, you know measures definitely you can whenever you are digitizing any form of data you know uh, you will be able to go and look back at the same data while you were not doing it uh, you know through any digital help like you are writing on a normal paper hundreds of prescription given any kind of efficiency or any kind of data insights would not be visible whereas wherever whenever you are moving to a digital help you will be able to have a lot of measures set in. Uh, for yourself, I, I can't even define one, two. There could be hundreds of efficiency measures which you can define. Moment you move on to 
any digital uh, platform, whether it's a digital paper, whether it's a digital tab or a computer laptop based technology. Okay, this question comes from uh, a very good point. Just a quick answer would do. Uh, are the dentists also considered by Ministry of Health as registered medical practitioners, RMPs? Yes. I guess so, yes. Uh, okay, as per my understanding, all of them are if they have passed out from a legal authorized government institution which has a yeah. validated answer to give a degree. Uh, coming back to this, there is a uh, uh, there is a question from Dr. Ni, uh, Nidun uh, Jacob, founder of Zipun, uh, Zipur Health. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on online procurement platforms of medical devices and supplies for healthcare providers? And what do you feel are the pain points in these areas in procuring online? Um, Pankaj, please go ahead. Okay, so no, I, I said there's an amazing future for this. Believe me, on a lot of these procurement related platforms, I'm sure things will uh, will move on. You have to just get the right knack of it because today, uh, not only these kind of situations, even otherwise, the transition, as Dr. AK said, that transition from hospitals to platforms is going to happen You know, for the patient. Similarly, in the buying behavior also, a lot of transition would happen onto online stuff because online will always be able to give you better transparency and price visibility. Few challenges which you'll definitely face in this is going to be your price competitiveness, your distribution channel, how you are able to reach out to every single individual who is willing to buy a product out there, your own marketing skill sets. Okay, uh, so there is a question coming from Dr. Dinesh Agrawal. Uh, uh, how do you handle staff salary these days? Uh, this is not a technical question in terms of medical sciences, but it's a very, very important persistent question. So probably, Dr. Singhal, how are you handling it? Probably if you can share some light on that. So I have a total of 200 staff working in my three companies. And the situation is different in two companies versus other companies. Now, when I talk about the physical hospital, ours was mainly both the hospitals were elective surgery hospitals and the work has completely, like virtually come to a standstill. And the nurses and the, pay, and the ward boys and the doctors, the junior doctors can themselves see that the hospital is not earning revenue. So actually we sat and talked to them and uh, they are okay to take a haircut of almost 50%. And that depends upon also the grade of the employee. We've assured a basic minimum for all the employees and the people who are senior, they've taken a larger haircut. But when it comes to my digital health company, Fitterfly, actually we are seeing a lot of interest uh, from people having diabetes, women undergoing pregnancy, and uh, people with PCOS. So actually, we have signed up a lot of contracts in the last two weeks itself. Uh, I think uh, the big contracts. And because of that, we haven't done any salary reduction at uh, Fitterfly at all. And the beautiful thing is, we could actually make our organization leaner. I had three floors for my organization. I let go of two floors because I could suddenly see that all my employees in the digital health company can work from home. There is no need to, for them to come, uh, come to the office, actually. So I think there are two dimensions to health. So the companies which are, uh, which are low on CAPEX do not have much rentals to give. And the work can be completely transferred working remotely. Those companies can stay productive. And for them, they, they should try to give their employees uh, whatever best wages they can give. But where employees can actually see in a physical hospital that there is no revenue coming, uh, they will need to talk to the employees one on one and ask them to you know, stand up for this particular time and help out the organization. Okay, uh, so uh, this is something that uh, has been a question from again and again from certain people. They were asking about Bandar RI, so they are asking about the product or the system and the things that you talk Pankaj. So we have been answering them on your behalf that they can reach to us so that we can able to get you connected to them. And we will of course uh, be also sharing the answers and the questions with all the concerned people who wanted to know more about this. Uh, coming back to the last few questions, because we have seven minutes left uh, in the whole discussion and we have some 35, 36 questions open till now. So how effective is, uh, uh, you know, this whole process? We have been answering this regularly. So let me just skip this question and, uh, and we will try to skip uh, as this model. Ah, somebody's asked this question. Do you see this as a good business model to reach out to schools post this uh, pandemic situation is over? Uh, as a pre health checkup thing, uh, what would be your take on that, Dr. Singh? So I used to run a company which was into school health checkups. I ran that for two years. And now schools are very, very difficult organizations to work with. And none of the companies which have worked with schools on health or any ancillary services have been able to scale up. And there'll be a lot of resistance from the from the uh, from the investors also if you, if they want to invest in a company which is dealing with schools. 
schools are going to face another existential uh, a lot of existential challenges uh, because of covid they will be the first one of the first few uh, businesses which will start suffering and i can already see that uh, government is coming up with regulations of not paying fees or delaying the salaries and all those things so i think it's not going to be a very good segment for the next couple, couple of years to work in okay uh, so just one question quickly to take it up uh, pankaj this is a question coming from nanduri suresh uh, as a doctor we if we adopt digital practices sharing the rx through whatsapp or any digital form is there a chance of losing the revenue for the pharmacy or do you see we can overcome this or minimize this uh, so how is the so i didn't understand how the pharmacy so i think so uh, coming from the background of the uh, doctor's question here this would be that they would be having an internal pharmacy at their own nursing home or hospital and they would be uh, concerned that if sharing the digital uh, information with the patient directly on a whatsapp or other digital platforms uh, will that uh, you know change in their uh, uh, selling uh, or okay. capabilities no, so definitely if you are using those open platforms which are not connected to your ecosystem of fulfillment you are definitely going to lose revenue on that and that's where i would add another point to wonder rx when when you write on that digital paper on that smart paper which you write we also give you your connectivity to your entire ecosystem so that you can connect your patients with that ecosystem of yours whereby convenient and cost reduction reduced deliveries can be done for the patients oh great okay. so uh, uh, if patient call and connect the doctor rather than the doctor calling the patient via telemed by any available social platform or through specific telemedicine platform do we still need a consent since when a patient initiates it comes from under implied consent as in understand please clarify i think the consent still needs to be taken uh, because uh, the the call may be for something else rather than a consultation so you need to yeah. very clearly say that it's a consultation i am so and so that needs to happen there is was two couple of questions here dr singhal that you probably will be the best person to answer how do you ensure uh, the doctor gets paid on a e consultation <laughs> so at our hospital we have our own payment gateway so that's not a challenge and whenever i do e consults i've been doing it for last 10 years uh, i give my bank number and i do the consultation only after the payment has been done and i think a lot of other platforms run by third parties uh, and e pharmacy players also have a payment feature in them um so i think uh, the early days when the internet banking or internet payments were not so good there were a lot of challenges in delayed payments or not coming on time and stuff like that but with the current systems and the crms in place uh, i think it's not a challenge anymore so you so always choose a platform which has got a payment gateway yeah, normally payment gateway yeah. so we have one common question uh, coming from a nutritionist uh, uh, two nutritionists have asked the same question how do you see the digital platform helping them in the consultation process probably pankaj if you can answer that uh, yeah. from the technical side of it uh, so I, i guess you know this is something which again uh, will have a very nice and positive impact on the dietitian uh, field because you don't need to really go into too much of face to face stuff the, the kind of digital consultations or e consults for uh, dietitians for uh, probably psychologists uh, counselors you know these are the things which i i believe is just a mindset change and definitely it can be done remotely on lot and lot of cases depends on what kind of dietitian you are in in what all category you have been trained on uh, basis that i think a lot of good uh, revenue optimization can happen from there and i i would like to add something to that uh, when i yeah, yeah, please 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 i run a company which is primarily employs dietitians and coaches for disease management uh, so we work actively with patients with diabetes and also women having pregnancy or pcos and they are mostly dietitians uh, masters what we have seen is that uh, you know patients are very happy and willing to engage with dietitian remotely as something like we said and predicted because clearly there is not much to examine all you need is to understand uh, the disease of the patient the requirements the kind of cuisine which they eat and uh, we have our own software which is called uh, intuitive which these dietitians use for sending messages doing consultations doing dietary analysis making diet plans so i think uh, dietary consultations and nutritionist uh, platform is something which can be very easily done uh, remotely using telehealth so what are the other uh, uh, doctor what are the other specialties which are best suited for telemedicine then actually that's a good question i made a full list from us and india which uh, there's a lot of data around it so general practice dermatology okay. diabetes and endocrinology and then uh, psychiatry mental health pediatrics rheumatology immunology infectious diseases and radiology and pathology so these are the eight nine specialties which almost 80 90% of the work can uh, move to telehealth there are other specialties which find a lot of issue and there was a question around ophthalmology also 
you know um, so ophthalmology is something where a slit lens examination or a close examination needs to be done there are new devices coming which can examine the retina and the image can be sent but still you need to go to a physical center uh, there is an app now available in iphone where you can screen the retina but that is not uh, very accurate it can be good as a screening purpose so ophthalmology certainly faces a lot of challenges similarly orthopedics ent dental and general surgery so these five six branches face a lot of challenges when it comes to in my assessment in all these specialties not more than 30 40% of the consults can be done online but patient who have already seen you in the clinic and they need to come for a follow up that all can happen using telemedicine great great so uh, uh, just coming to two last questions which will be closing this uh, whole uh, seminar uh, discussion modes would be uh this is a question which was for the for sales for the some time and has been coming up again and again what is the difference of satisfaction factor when it comes from a traditional practice vis a vis digital practice when you see this uh but probably uh, dr singhal you can answer this and then pankaj you can also give your take from your uh, industry aspect so and actually, one more, uh, yeah sorry. and one more aspect to this adding to it which i had a question of that what happens if uh, you are able to consult a patient uh, to a maximum extent and the still the patient wants to meet you but is not able to do it then how do you extend the physical part of the consultation via uh, this whole mode of all uh, which you are running as a current mode today so i'll answer the second question first because this situation has been arising in my practice for last 7 8 years so a lot of get lot of consultations from children from various parts of the world where they need an examination so typically ask them to go to their pediatrician and the pediatrician records a short 10 20 30 second video doing an examination and they send it to me through an email so you can go to your local doctor if the doctor your uh, uh, doctor you do teleconsulting if he is a specialist or far away then you can probably go to your local doctor get an examination done secondly sometimes we have what we have also done is we have given the patient certain thing to do and record a video of that and send it back to us which serve acts as a surrogate kind of you know uh, examination which can be done um, and the first question uh, can you repeat it again vinayak sorry uh so the first question is what do you see from the traditional practice to the digital practices what is the difference that you see pankaj talked a lot about eye to eye contact i think with good video and good internet you can establish eye to eye contact and for certain specialties uh, i think in the coming few years uh, with the scare of covid uh, expensive transport parking time wastage and doing all that i think the satisfaction scores for certain diseases will start reaching uh, the traditional practice but for certain things it still may not reach uh okay so pankaj what's your take on this yeah so i i would say one of the satisfactory factor would be if you can you know doctors can reduce the cost of consultation while they are meeting <laughs> that be one of the best one because you know if you imagine a traditional uh, wherein you have to set up a clinic and do all that imagine you are sitting at home with just a uh, you know payment gateway and a laptop definitely your costs go down and if you still want to see some patient there are starbucks out there you know you always do that so imagine so would, uh, uh, on the doctor's behalf i would say this this is an uh, a situation of picasso like uh, doing a painting uh, whether he does it on a sketch or on a paper it still will cost you the same because it's a picasso's yeah, knowledge yeah, exactly not the <laughs> environment that is going to be okay so there is a question dr uh, akshay p jadhav had uh, uh, challenges for a patient to combine the prescription lab reports radiology reports etc into a different uh, case history it probably he's trying to understand that how does he do that so very quickly on the behalf of saving the time and going to the last question uh, before we close this is uh, that uh, wonder rx as his software as pankaj has explained is able to uh, merge all of these data into one box of service and information or along with the audio clip of the consultation which was being done with the patient and the doctor in one space for the doctor through his app which is a indigenous app patented uh, technology done by them and uh, probably uh, dr akshay we will get back to you probably more with the uh, pankaj on a one to one so probably uh, you know pankaj then you can take this up on an individual basis if, if i may just quickly add uh, because there were quite a few questions which were uh, related so as as wonder rx what uh, because we were we were uh, being asked on the questions lot of it so we have got three products one is the smart paper which doctors can uh, use continue to write but it will be uh, as digital as any other platform through the paper the second uh, is wherein we are uh, giving uh, all the providers whether it's a physiotherapist dietitian counselor psychologist everyone to come on board on our platform and be connected to the patients now this particular feature is going to get launched shortly as well whereby 
you know if you have as a patient i have to find a dietitian where should i go or a psychologist and also we are aggregating all that we have quite a few questions on that as well and which includes e consultation probably down the uh, months towards that uh, pakka just add one more point to this uh, uh, before we take the last question because there is a very connecting question to it uh, if you want to take telemedicine to the rural belt what should be the beginning of doing that what should be the first step in doing telemedicine probably dr singhal can also throw some light on that quickly and then we'll take the last question and finish look from a technology perspective nothing much would change you just need to have a good system at your end with some good cameras low bandwidth uh, capable stuff and then from an execution perspective i think you would from a village perspective you would want to go to the local panchayats and all which are going to be uh, facilitating all these kind of uh, stuff so i guess there are quite a few uh, companies in fmcg sector who are already doing this wherein they have set up a lot of panchayats and all these kind of systems which can be even acting as uh, your e consult platforms as well yeah. yeah okay so to the very last question before we wrap this up uh, pankaj and dr singhal thanks a lot for being sharing such a knowledgeable thought process of whole concept of the telemedicine as well as the future of the digital healthcare industry uh, what is the best way to reach out to both of you of course a lot of people are asking this so we will be sharing them the email ids of what you would like to share with them so that they can consult with you on one to one maybe through emote but having said all of this do you see india which is not so much of a literate country and we have majority which is still not able to understand english as a language of communication will be able to take it from the patient's point of view when it comes to the telemedicine benefits advances technologies or even basically understanding india as of today in the mobile phone industry is 126 crore mobile phones uh, which are smartphones but the fact is we have a 3.2% uh, 3.2x of people using mobile phones so majority of people have two phones which means a majority of indians around 50 crore people do not have a smartphone how do you see that they will be able to understand emote and able to take up this whole challenges of telemedicine from the patient's point of view what you see to make that simplified both of so you i think uh, that's a wonderful question i think uh, where some of the people have two phones but the opposite fact is also true in a typical family of four or five people only one person may be having a mobile phone which is good enough to give access to the whole family for a telemedicine consult or a telemedicine platform and the second thing india is a land of diversity both from language as well as cuisine and everything else which we do so the telemedicine platform should address at least the top 10 or 12 vernacular languages which becomes very important and similarly the content which we push out for health should be in multi language format so i think if you if you take care of these couple of things i will see that india has leapfrogged the uh, a couple of things which the western world couldn't do similarly i'm very sure that indians would be able both the doctors and the patients would be able to adopt digital mediums uh, very fast and we will get surprised great and what's your thought pankaj on this if we, can, if we can add the vernacular part to it you know in all the e consultation stuff and there are enough systems coming up i i guess the problem stands resolved to a lot so from a infrastructure wise we are already going good uh, dr ak said that we still have a phone at least one and even in village we can still have a few i remember a days when one tower one village and everybody was on to that Speaker uh, phone uh, on that, so we are still in a far better situation. So if we are able to get from English to a vernacular kind of a stuff, and we can have more apps doing that, that will help a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Singhal and Pankaj, for this excellent mm-hmm. seminar. We in this short span answered seventy plus questions, and there are six, uh, ten, or fifteen questions rather uh, still open to it. But in the interest of time. which i understand is very short at hand with us we have already overshot by 10 minutes uh, we will uh, try to answer them uh, through sharing these questions with you and probably you can uh, write this to the people individually who have asked these questions that would be a great help thanks a lot once again and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this uh, excellent uh, webinar uh, thank you pankaj thank you dr singhal and thank you all the uh, participants who were here with this we would like to end this uh, anything you would like to give a closing note to pankaj and dr singhal please i think uh, sorry because of the paucity of time we could not answer all the questions so uh, please feel free to reach out to mr vinayak he'll be able to route it through to us uh, you can find us on linkedin just google pankaj sindhu wonder rx i shared that pankaj uh, i've shared that on the system i'll be sharing dr singhal and your linkedin ids also to all the participants we had 324 people 
in the total process of it. So we'll be sharing it with everyone. Yeah, and watch out for innovative launches. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Vinayak, and thanks, thanks everybody for attending. Yep. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay.